Welcome to this conference on constitutionalism and the free society, a, con a conference in celebration of both the 10th anniversary of the research group on constitutional studies at McGill University, more or less, it was originally scheduled for last December, which would have come closer, and in celebration of the 200th anniversary of McGill University itself. On behalf of my conference co-organizer, Victor Muniz Fraticelli, Associate Professor of Law and Political Science, and myself, I'm Jacob Levy, uh, Tomlinson Professor of Political Theory and the coordinator of RGCS. I'd like to welcome colleagues uh, from McGill and from around the world, students and alumni of McGill of RGCS. We have some dozens of alumni of RGCS programs uh, registered and in attendance, both on the program and off the program, and we're particularly pleased to have you here, um, and other guests from McGill from Montreal and from around the world. We come together at what I think is an exciting time for the study of constitutionalism, um, if a somewhat fraught time for the practice of constitutionalism. The study of constitutionalism, it seems to me, is in the midst of several overlapping sources of renaissance and rejuvenation. Uh, there has been a shift to international, comparative, transnational, and global perspectives on constitutionalism, much of which has been associated with the thriving journal ICON, the International Journal of Constitutional Law, uh, uh, providing a very healthy and salutary shift away from an exclusive preoccupation with the United States in the study of what constitutionalism and constitutional government requires. Within political theory, there has been a turn to so-called political constitutionalism, partly associated with the rise of Republican political theory and partly uh, in conversation with the related turns to realist and political political theory. We have with us representatives of the Princeton School of Constitutionalism, long associated with the late Walter Murphy, um, whose students and students' students uh, kept alive the idea of constitutionalism and public law as a central preoccupation within disciplinary political science at a time when it was relatively neglected in the rest of the discipline. The contributions of positive political theory and political economy to institutionalism within political science are, I think, gradually being incorporated into and integrated with more explicitly normative concerns and jurisprudential concerns. Both political science and law are coming to take much more seriously the importance of studying polycentric and pluralistic legal systems. Not only the specific case of federalism, though there has been uh, considerable growth in the study of federalism from new perspectives in recent years, but also the study drawing on fields from the Blooming's, Bloomington School associated with Eleanor Ostrom to the constitutional standing of First Nations and other indigenous peoples around the world, to what multi-level and multi-system governance and law and legal codes look like. There is also, I'll happily note, um, the movement toward an integration of normative political theory with empirical political science, um, associated in part with the political theory in and as political science collaboration that includes RGCS as well as our partners from Stanford, Duke, and NYU, which will have a concluding workshop uh, at the end of this conference. And more broadly, intellectually speaking, the study of constitutionalism has moved beyond what I think of as a kind of exclusive US Warren Court preoccupation with the counter-majoritarian difficulty and the philosophically precise specification of just what rights an entrenched judiciary enforcing an entrenched bill of rights ought to enforce against a putatively democratic legislature. The study of executive power and the abuse of executive power, the study of questions about how democratic, meaning how representative, how responsive, and how contestatory that legislature in that imagined model might be, the study of what other institutional prerequisites are necessary for something like law-governed constitutional government, from civilian control of the military to the rule of law and non-corruption and relative independence in the civil service, 
two questions about the party structure and underlying questions about the political economy and social order that might be a prerequisite for the kinds of government studied under the label of constitutionalism. All of these are being uh, brought back again to the fore and in assembling this conference, we've really aimed to bring representatives from those various schools of thought and developing intellectual trends together into what we look forward to as a conversation across these three days, uh, across these four days. Of course, that increased uh, analytical perspective on what constitutionalism is and con what constitutional government requires arises partly because in the world, it has become less possible to take for granted the stability, the democratic character, and the rule of law governedness of liberal democracies that had been, uh, had been treated under that name in the category of constitutional analysis or constitutional studies for many years. And so the question of what would count beyond the formal institution of an independent judiciary looking at a formally democratic legislature, what would count as a suitable institutional arrangement to provide stable, responsive, law-governed, representative, and yes, sometimes liberal constitutional orders has uh, returned to prominence partly as our ability to take those institutions for granted has been steadily whittled away. And I expect that over our four days, we will be talking not only about law and political science and political theory, but about the world and about what the prospects are for constitutionalism and constitutional government um, in the countries that are represented here and in the countries that are studied by the scholars who are represented here. Um, this conference is the culmination of a three-year grant from the John Templeton Foundation to the Research Group on Constitutional Studies, um, and we gratefully acknowledge the support of the Templeton Foundation, as well as additional funding from the Institute for Liberal Studies and from the John Dobson Foundation. We also gratefully appreciate um, the support of the McGill 200 Bicentennial Committee. McGill University is situated on the traditional territory of the Kanyingi Kikaha, a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. We recognize and respect them as the traditional custodians of the land and waters on which we meet today. I want to draw particular attention to two special events on the program. One is that tomorrow at 4.30, not 4 o'clock, the regular panel time, we will have a keynote address by Melissa Schwartzberg, the Silver Professor of Politics at New York University. And Saturday, starting at 11 o'clock, for those of you who are participants in the political theory in and as political science collaboration, we will have our annual Young Scholars Workshop. Um, I'd also like to draw some attention to uh, the graduate student panel on Friday, which will include papers by PhD students who are either are now or have recently been students at RGCS. Among our goals at this conference, are not only to bring the contributions of those schools of thought and ideas into conversation with each other and to bring their contributions to McGill, at least virtually in a way that can benefit and enrich our intellectual community here, but also to bring some of the work that we've been doing at RGCS. We being not only our faculty, but our postdoctoral fellows, our students and our alumni in their continuing academic and scholarly careers into engagement with all of you from around the world. And as one piece of that, uh, we will be highlighting the work of some of our PhD students and uh, recent alumni who are in PhD programs. And with that, I'm going to turn to our uh, opening roundtable. We are joined this morning by Pratap Banu Mehta, by Turkulur Ishiksel, and by Tom Ginsberg. Um, Tom Ginsberg is the Leo Spitz Professor of International Law and Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago. Turk, who is Associate Professor of Political Science at Columbia University, uh, and both Tom and Turk, who are among the uh, many participants in this conference who are returning guests to RGCS in one way or another, and we welcome you back. And Prateh Banu Mehta has been 
Vice Chancellor of Ashoka University and President of the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi, uh, among many other positions. Full biographies of all of our speakers are available at the program, and I'll encourage conference chairs not to do much longer than that. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it over to Tom. Thank you so much, Jacob, and it's an honor to be here with you, everyone, and with my fellow co-panelists here. Um, I want to just say a few words about where we are from my perspective. <clears throat> and I think it's an extraordinarily exciting time, actually, to be studying these issues. Just to echo something that Jacob said in his opening remarks, I mean, the world is changing in pretty remarkable ways, and many old assumptions need to be discarded before we, uh, uh, just prior to the panel, Pratap Anumeta and I were just sort of chatting about COVID and how, you know, some of the countries which have done well, you wouldn't expect some of the countries which have not done well, you would have expected to do better. Um, we are seeing obviously tremendous generational ferment in at least this Western democracy. Um, and we're also seeing, of course, tremendous authoritarian resilience um, that calls into question many assumptions of a prior generation. So there's a lot going on. And I think it's an exciting time to be thinking about these issues from the beginning with so many assumptions upended. My core construct is constitutional democracy, which, um, you know, I've drawn, I guess, it, <clears throat> definitionally, I draw on from my work with uh, Aziz Haq in thinking about what are the you know, essential components there. And some of you may disagree. But in our construct, obviously, you need elections in which losers give up power classic core feature, um, but we also emphasize that democracy is essentially must be legally constructed through the existence of rights to vote, rights to speak, rights to assemble, rights to organize, a small set of core liberal rights. And then a third element, uh, which often is not included in classical, simple political science definitions, is what we call the rule of the bureaucratic rule of law, the rule of law in administration which just functionally is necessary if you're going to have an election in which the votes are counted accurately. Um, so there's some deep sense in which you need people to follow the rules. Um, more deeply, having a kind of bureaucracy that follows instructions is essential to reducing the stakes of politics, because if, as exists in many countries, you know, whoever wins an election can stock the entire bureaucracy with supporters, well, that undermines any incentive to ever give up power. Um, so there's, you know, a classic idea of reducing the stakes is important here. And that's sort of how constitutional democracy functions. Well, so defined, we are in trouble. <laughs> there's now more people for about five years now, more people living in non-democracies than democracies. Obviously, uh, the is going to presume tell us a little bit about India, but that, that country has recently been downgraded in many definitions, which means uh, a significant um, you know, majority of people actually live in non-democracies. And also, if you just count systems, there are more uh, autocracies than democracies. And so that's, that's, that's a problem. There's also, it seems to be a generational uh, crisis of confidence in democracy, at least here in this one, uh, where people no longer believe that it is the ideal system. They long for something different. And obviously, that is critical for maintaining a critical problem, a critical challenge. At the same end, um, so just drawing on one other idea from our book, from Professor Huckin's book is, well, you know, so how did this happen? How did this, how did democracies end? And we are learning that it really is sort of hand-to-hand -hand combat. We identify two agents of change or agents of democratic erosion. And here my primary, you know, target is the many democracies, which die, of course, slowly rather than it's pretty well known in the literature. Democracy is not upended by <clears throat> a military coup or a communist revolution anymore. It's the product of a death of a thousand cuts by specific agents. And we identify two in our book. One um, are, you know, the charismatic populist. Again, I think we're all pretty familiar with the, the populist um, uh, leader who claims to only um, speak, speak for the people and no other institution can get in the way of the leader and the, and the people. And then another agent, which I think maybe it's not so well identified, but a political party, 
that gives up on democracy, partisan degradation, we call it. And exhibit A there would be, I think, the United States of America, where we have a party which was certainly large swaths of which were willing to upend our constitutional democracy in January 6th. So this is a construct in our 2018 book, which I wish had, you know, we hadn't had any examples, but we certainly do. Um, and we see in other parties. And I think, you know, the United States under Trump, India currently are characterized by both of these threats, right? And charismatic populists and parties which don't necessarily aren't committed to the rules of the game. So it's a tremendous uh, and complicated challenge. And so at the same time, as empirical political scientists, we know that democracy is resilient. And when you have a democracy like that of the United States and like that of India that has existed for many, many decades, um, you know, they're very difficult to actually end. And if one looks or if one trusts things like the quality scores of the Freedom House ratings, um, you know, generally speaking, once you make six or seven decades of being a democracy, there's no chance of it actually ending. Um, I think France from 1876 to 1939 was uh, the, the longest democracy, which was overturned. Of course, that was the product of the war. So, um, you know, there is something deep about these resilient patterns. And we can talk about whether that's cultural or institutional, exactly what the source of it is. Um, so that should, on the other hand, then give one some hope. Now, um, I guess what I want to talk about is, you know, we know that the law is essential to this construct. The law is essential to democratic erosion. That is the first thing you do when you are a charismatic populist or a party that wants to give up is you capture the institutions of the law. The courts, you know, are the target one uh, because folks have learned that courts matter. I think of my own work, you know, my own career, and I sort of started studying democracy in the early 90s, and this sort of assumption was like, no pen, you know, no sword. I mean, excuse me, no purse, no sword, no problem. When the only power is the pen, how bad can courts be? Well, we've learned that, you know, the expansion of judicial power is obviously been accompanied by the politicization of the judiciary in many countries. And uh, it's difficult because of constructs like the rule of law, a simplistic version of the rule of law says you have to follow whatever the judges say. So, you know, that notion of the rule of law obviously can contribute to democratic erosion. Um, and then, of course, we also see the courts and the law used as agents of limiting freedom of speech, of bypassing checks and balances, and of undermining bureaucratic confidence or bureaucratic autonomy. Um, so that suggests that the law is a critical thing for saving democracy, for figuring out how it's resilient, a critical terrain. Now, um, in another bit of work, we looked at cases that we call near misses. That is countries that seemed to be backsliding and about the democracy was about to end. And then something happened at the 11th hour and uh, democracy was somehow you know, saved or you know, set right. And you might consider the United States just this year being a near miss. But uh, the cases we looked at were Sri Lanka under the first Rajapaksa regime, uh, where, you know, at the 11th hour, Sri Sena breaks off and starts a new party. And my gosh, you know, the institutions are saved, maybe only temporarily. But um, that's certainly one example. Colombia, uh, you know, in when uh, um, Alvaro Uribe was seeking a third term, despite the Constitution saying that only one term was allowed for the presidency. And the Constitutional Court standing up saying, no, enough. You know, that we, we did let you take a second term. Um, but you can't amend the Constitution a third time to have a third term. That undermines the entire structure of the constitutional democracy. So, um, and some other cases. What do they have in common? They have in common a kind of substantive view of democracy, a political competition, not a formalist one, that sort of looking at the institutional structure as it exists in the country and trying to understand what the actual threats are. Exactly the kinds of things the American Supreme Court doesn't do. We also notice that. What saves democracy in these situations over and over again are institutions that themselves are not legitimated democratically. The military is not legitimated democratically, but if a military, the military had gone on, on with the Rajapaksas, right, in Sri Lanka, democracy would be over. So the idea that, you know, the 
military is going to preserve, or Trump was another example. He wanted his generals to come out in the streets, and the military made clear well before January 6th that they were not playing that game, which is why we ended up with the clown show that we, you know, the clowns that we got. But, you know, obviously a much easier choice would have been for Trump as commander in chief to order the military to come, you know, secure the ballot or whatever it was. So um, the military didn't go along. So that's another institution, critical institution, not legitimated democratically, which is essential for the preservation of democracy and bureaucracy, right? The fact that in my country, tens of thousands of local elected officials withstood basically mobs, I don't know how well reported this was outside the United States, but clamoring to get into the ballot counting rooms, saying stop the steal, intimidating and uh, bullying. Uh, and yet tens of thousands of local officials didn't go along with that. And they did count the ballot in places like Georgia. Intra-party uh, checks are also really important. Now here, I think an important case would be something like Jacob Zuma, right? where the ANC finally, after you know, being kind of uh, coerced into doing so by a set of independent institutions, a set of institutions not legitimate in democracy, finally the party, you know, woke up. Um, um, you know, so, and, and this actually goes to a critical point Daniel Ziblatt's made. You know, I think the critical issue in many democracies is whether the conservatives defect. Conservatives generally are minorities of the population, uh, but they play the political game and they tend to win, you know, half the time, at least in most, most industrial democracies. So, you know, when the conservatives, as seems to be happening in some elements of the Republican Party in the United States, you know, decide that there's no future or no hope for them, then they might defect. And that turns out to be deadly for democracy. So, uh, Institutions matter, nonpartisan institutions matter, fourth branch institutions matter, but one cannot predict, one cannot identify a single magic institution. It's something about the configuration of them and the way they interact. I think South Africa is a great story here where you have the public protector of the constitutional court, et cetera, and finally um, incentivizing actual political forces and parties um, that's critical for the the saving of constitutional democracy against uh, severe challenge. We're going to see many more of these challenges at the same time. Um, you know, I'm eternally optimistic for reasons I can't quite articulate, uh, but I do think the generational change is going to is going to help save us. And with that, I'll stop. Great, thank you, uh, Kirk. Um, hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for this invitation. I'm uh, really delighted to be at this conference. Um, although I, like most people, um, wish that we were in, actually in Montreal, um, maybe next year. <laughs> um, so the conference document rightly points out um, that constitutional democracy is a type of democracy and it should be treated as such. Uh, the starting point for my remarks um, and the starting point for much of my work um, on this issue is that democratic constitutionalism is a type of constitutionalism. Um, that in itself is no big reveal. Um, the early modern precursors of today's um, standard constitutional mechanisms had little to do with popular government or anything like that, but that's not my area. So I wanna talk rather about constitutionalism's non-democratic uses today. Um, so particularly over the last decade or two, scholars have investigated the ways in which um, the recognizable features of constitutional rule get used in non-democratic contexts. Um, and um, I'm going to talk about um, and distinguish between two such contexts. The first is the use of constitutional mechanisms in the service of authoritarian or hybrid regimes. And the second is the use of constitutional mechanisms to enable international cooperation to achieve specific policy aims. So um, I'll call these authoritarian constitutionalism and functional constitutionalism and say a little bit about each of them in turn. 
Um, so the elegant corpus of political theory that we all know and love um, has trouble making sense of um, these regimes, except by marking them as deeply flawed um, or deficient or worse as contradictory. Um, and I won't argue that there's anything worth aspiring to in varieties of non-democratic constitutionalism, but I'm also not satisfied with dismissing variants of non-democratic constitutionalism as contradictions in terms or as abusive or as or sets. Um, I'm, um, I, I think they're worth taking seriously um, because they reveal the relationship between democracy and constitutionalism to be far more complex than the classic dilemma, um, uh, quote, between individual rights and reified majority will as the conference brief puts it. So um, consider um, as, a, as a kind of foil, a fairly conventional view of constitutionalism as a, as a technique of limited government. Um, so for the sake of fixing ideas, I'm gonna to refer to Giovanni Sartori's um, sort of uh, admirably single-minded defense of this conception in a 1962 APSR article, um, where Sartori writes that constitutionalism is, quote, a technique of liberty, um, quote, a frame of political society organized through and by the law for the purpose of restraining arbitrary power and to thereby ensure a limited government, end of quote. Now in this view, constitutionalism has little to do with democratic rule in the first place. Um, so non-democratic constitutionalism presents no uh, special problem. Um, so, but from Sartori's point of view, the first type of non-democratic constitutionalism that I referred to, namely authoritarian constitutionalism is a non sequitur. Um, authoritarian regimes often have constitutions, the Sartori view can concede that, but it, it can't make sense of authoritarian constitutions except to say that these can at best be sham or facade constitutions, um, whose strictures have little bearing on the actual exercise of power. Um, but recent work by constitutional scholars and my uh, fellow uh, panelist Tom Ginsburg among them um, ha has uh, shown that it is meaningful to speak of authoritarian constitutionalism. Um, I'll uh, uh, here I'll, I'll refer to kind of my own conception of it as a system uh, where familiar mechanisms like judicial review, like hierarchies of norms, like amendment procedures, rights norms. Um, serve to uphold the authoritarian character of the regime. So for example, they help elites capture and hold the levers of the state to thwart opposition, to crack down on pluralism, to restrict the rights and liberties of citizens um, in the name of public order. So um, contrary to the assumptions and expectations that are built into a limited government conception of constitutionalism like Sartori's, authoritarian regimes can and do practice what I've called constitutional discipline. That is to say, they don't treat constitutional rules as mere parchment barriers that crumple under the exigencies of power. Um, of course, authoritarian uh, leaders and movements reshape constitutions in all sorts of ways in order to expand, um, in order to expand rather and cement their power. Um, but the fact that they see the need to amend a constitution in order to get their way testifies, I think, to the practical significance of constitutional norms and mechanisms. Um, and, I, and I wanna say that um, I don't consider authoritarian constitutionalism an alien life form, um, but rather is a practice that exploits the built-in hegemonic potential of constitutional norms and uses them to the hilt. So constitutionalism scholars um, like our uh, keynote lecturer, Melissa Schwartzberg, um, Rand Herschel and others have established that constitutional norms can be used to entrench and um, preserve existing hierarchies of power. Um, and authoritarian regimes capitalize on precisely this tendency and push it to the extreme. So the disciplining logic of higher law constitutionalism suits them just fine, especially um, as long as it allows them to discipline their rivals. Um, uh, the scholarship um, um, on the work that constitutionalism does in hybrid and authoritarian regimes um, uh, shows the relationship between constitutionalism and the free society to borrow our, um, from our conference theme um, to be empirically and conceptually far more contingent and fragile 
um, than both scholars and practitioners have tended to assume, at least for a long time, although I think that that um, expectation is, is rapidly breaking up. Um, emancipatory principles are not baked into constitutional systems. Uh, constitutional systems come in many different flavors and can be used, uh, uh, can be made rather using uh, many different recipes with dramatically different results. Um, and most disquietingly, I think, the specific constitutional, constitutional mechanisms that encourage liberal political dynamics in one context can sustain authoritarian practices in another, and it can be quite tricky to specify the conditions under which that kind of variation happens. Now, as a political theorist, I'm all too happy to sidestep these messy empirical questions, um, but I find the example of Hungary um, analyzed by Kim Shepley to be quite instructive. Um, so in Shepley's account, the Fides government made a habit of defending its head spinning array of democracy eroding constitutional measures by pointing out, quote, that there was some law just like it somewhere in Europe. Um, so bits and pieces of not obviously objectionable constitutional mechanisms borrowed from democratic exemplars like Finland or Austria were used to stitch together what Shepley calls a Frankenstein, a constitutional system whose thrust was unmistakably authoritarian. Um, so a question that I would have um, for my fellow panelists and the, and the rest of the conference participants would be given the considerable work that's been done over the past 10, 15 years on authoritarian constitutionalism, what other questions remain to be asked and explored on that theme? Um, so I mentioned at the start um, that I could think of two major kinds of non-democratic constitutionalism and having talked a little bit about the authoritarian variant, um, I'll say a little bit about what I call the functional variant which I associate with international institutions that have been set up for a specific purpose, um, but have also been equipped with features that we tend to associate with constitutional systems, such as judicial review, um, legislative powers, uh, hierarchies of norms topped by explicit rules of recognition, and justiciable provisions um, of individual rights. And the EU is the most advanced example, um, the example I know best. Um, it has many of the features of the constitutional system, but the rationale for its extraordinary authority has little to do with standard constitutional ideals like democratic self-rule or limited government or the protection of individual rights. Um, uh, rather, its authority is premised on the member state's commitment to the goal of economic integration. Um, if you wanna get misty-eyed about it, um, its authority is premised on the dream of achieving perpetual peace through shared prosperity. Now, to explain why this is quirky from a constitutional perspective, consider the heuristic that says that a constitution is supposed to set out the rules of the game rather than determine the outcomes of the game. Um, the metaphor is imperfect because we know that the way the rules are configured inevitably affect outcomes big time. Um, but consider that the EU's treaty system blows up that entire distinction insofar as the treaty set out an impossibly detailed, exhaustive list of obligations that member states have to uphold while de facto entrenching them through impossibly difficult amendment rules. And this makes the EU a bit of a, a, an anomaly, but an, I think an instructive one. Um, so in, a, in a, an APSR article from 2016, Mila Versteg and Emily Zakin observed that as an empirical matter, rigid constitutions, that is constitutions that are hard to amend, tend to be sparse. That is, they have relatively few and relatively open-ended provisions. Whereas specific constitutions with a lot of detailed rule type norms tend to be mutable, that is not entrenched um, or lightly entrenched. Um, and more recent constitutional documents tend to be lengthy and mutable, this sort of latter model. Um, I, and I would suggest that aside from this being an observed empirical regularity, um, uh, there are good normative reasons why it should be so. So constitutional norms that mandate specific policies should be relatively easy to amend through democratic mobilization. And on the other hand, entrenched constitutions should be sparse and open-ended enough to accommodate attempts by democratically elected legislatures to enact policy change in response to popular demands. Um, 
So borrowing a metaphor from Heather Gerken, we might think of this as the hydraulics of democratic constitutionalism. Um, but often the very point of having an international organization like the EU is to enable cooperation among sovereign states that face a problem of credible commitment. So um, international organizations that have constitutional features um, uh, have these precisely in order to insulate states' policy commitments against easy reversal by domestic political dynamics. So that means that EU treaty law is specific like ordinary statute and sometimes at the level of like administrative um, regulations, um, but it's also change resistant in the way of an entrenched constitutional system. Um, uh, one might say that uh, like this is not a democratic concern per se, because even though the EU itself is not democratic in any conventional sense, it helps to quote unquote, lock in the framework of liberal democracy domestically. I think it's fair to say that this assumption or maybe aspiration um, has come under a lot of pressure lately. Uh, for one thing, faith in the EU's lock-in function has been tested by democratic backsliding in member states. But also, um, as its powers have expanded, um, the domains of, as the EU's powers have expanded, the domains of policy that remain open to democratic decision-making have shrunk. Think of Greece at the height of its sovereign debt crisis, um, you know, the electorate cycling through center-left, far-left, center-right governments without affecting a whit of policy change. Um, and finally, I want to raise some doubts about the stability of a system of constitutionalism that is oriented toward a substantive policy purpose. So what I what I call functional constitutionalism. Um, and I'll, I'll end with an illustration of this. During one of the frantic moments of the sovereign debt crisis of the last decade, <clears throat> then president of the European Central Bank, Mario Draghi, captured the central tension of functional constitutionalism perfectly when he said, Quote, within our mandate, the ECB is ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. Now, what is wrong with that statement? Within our mandate, whatever it takes to save the euro. Within our mandate and whatever it takes are contradictory impulses. Whatever it takes is ultimately what constitutionalism can never mean. A constitutional system that is robustly purposive, as the EU is, contains this internal tension. EU watchers know the story, but after Draghi's statement, the ECB unveiled its controversial outright monetary uh, transactions program, the so-called OMT program, which authorized the ECB to purchase sovereign bonds issued by Eurozone states on the secondary market. Um, and critics, um, among them the German Federal Constitutional Court, uh, quickly noticed that the ECB was doing exactly what the treaty said it could not do. That is, you know, act as a de facto lender of last resort. And the matter went to the EU's Court of Justice, and it was faced with this like unenviable conflict between the EU's cardinal goal of economic integration, saving the euro, and so on, and respect for constitutional constraints on public power exercised by the EU, and it ultimately chose the former. Um, now, for those of you who are still awake, um, I want to acknowledge the limited utility of the schematic that I offer, you know, democratic constitutionalism versus authoritarian constitutionalism versus functional constitutionalism. I, I recognize these are all crude models, um, but I think there's a very real problem underneath all of this, which is the problem that um, Diana um, Kapizewski uh, termed constitutionalism with adjectives that Mark Tushnet describes as varieties of constitutionalism, um, or what I would simply call the pluralism of constitutional practice. So pluralism, um, as I understand it, is mostly a descriptive disposition uh, applied to the universe of constitutionalism. It tells us that variation exists, um, but it leaves open the big normative task um, of mapping and maintaining the bounds of liberal constitutionalism. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a great uh, privilege to be here. Thank you, Jacob um, uh, uh, and Victor uh, and the entire McGill team, um, and uh, particularly to be in conversation with uh, Turco and Tom, whose work um, I have admired. 
So um, I'll quickly make sort of two points. Most of my discussion around democratic backsliding will draw from the Indian experience, but I just want to begin with a couple of theoretical points about constitutionalism, which then sort of frame, in a sense, the Indian discussion. So building on sort of Tom's and sort of Turku's remarks, uh, it just struck me that if you ask the question, what do you expect constitutions to be doing? Uh, and one of the standard definitions in liberal constitutionalism is, of course, allocate different forms of authority, place limitations on governmental power. But traditionally, the two most important functions that constitutions perform are one, are, are literally in the term, they constitute, they constitute a people, they constitute citizenship, they convert humans into citizens, uh, uh, exclude people. And the second thing they did traditionally was they constituted social orders. Uh, uh, what kinds of intermediate associations, classes, social groupings, uh, in a sense, uh, are allowed and what kind of distribution of social power is permitted uh, in a society is also in some senses determined by the constitution. And with liberal constitution, the claim always was that this was a project of reconstituting society, not just limiting state power. You had to disembed individuals from individual communities, from the oppressiveness of society. Uh, I mean, to, to put it very crudely, if you feared society more, you empowered the state to liberate individuals from society. If you feared the state more, you were happy to, in a sense, go along with society. Right? So in that sense, right, this idea that constitutionalism is uniquely concerned with limitation of power is not true even to the history of liberalism. Uh, in fact, the opposite is true, that in order to get to that point, it has always had to constitute and reconstitute, I think, social orders. And I think this point will be, in a sense, I think, important for my story later on. I think, uh, particularly when you think of the first function of a constitution, which is constituting the people, uh, and constitutionalism's very problematic relationship uh, uh, with the concept of the people and idea of nationalism from the 19th century onwards. Now, there is no question, I think, um, in the minds of most observers that uh, India is actually a very critical juncture in its constitutional history. Uh, just to take a heuristic measure in the new VDEM measure, India has been downgraded. Uh, uh, its indicators on almost all aspects of liberal constitutionalism, not electoral democracy, uh, civil liberties, academic freedom, freedom of the press, uh, are now at the same level as they were measured in 1975, which was the last time India formally had the experience of emergency. Uh, but there are, of course, significant differences. I mean, the one difference I think, as Tom has demonstrated, is uh, this degradation of Indian constitutionalism is a death by a thousand cuts. Uh, you don't have the kind of mass arrests that you have, uh, let's say, in 1975. But I would argue that one level, this moment of constitutional degradation is more dangerous and more insidious um, for the following reason, which is, so there are two kinds of challenges Indian constitutionalism has always faced. One is the challenge from nationalism, the challenge from communalism, which is a contestation over the definition of the people leading to the degradation of liberal constitutionalism by inscribing structures of exclusion. That's sort of one big threat. Uh, 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 the second big threat is, of course, the erosion of uh, institutions that guard against authoritarianism, uh, executive power, discretionary power to the armed forces, for example, in places like Kashmir and so forth. Uh, and many of these instruments that, in a sense, uh, uh, are used to, uh, at least at the margins, degrade uh, liberal constitutionalism. Uh, these legal instruments have been on the books in almost all legal constitutionalism, as I think Turku sort of rightly pointed out. I mean, I think, you know, uh, we have, we've discovered how much executive power really uh, liberal democratic systems have. But what is special about, I think, this conjunction, which is in some sense is very different, uh, I think, from 1975, is that you have the conjunction of both authoritarianism and communalism and the national question aligning together, right? So it's not just that there'll be degradation on the level of civil liberties, but who is a citizen remains uncontested. Uh, it's actually both of these questions are uh, combined to create a toxic mix. And we are trying to understand 
what the shape of this new regime is. Um, so here's just a sample of descriptions of Indian constitutionalism at the moment, just from the last eight months of papers, electoral autocracy, militant democracy, the dual state, the triple state, democratic authoritarianism, party state, hybrid regime, populism, neo-fascism. Uh, I think we're still struggling to, in some senses, characterize what we are backsliding towards. Uh, one way of thinking about what we are backsliding towards, uh, rather than kind of quibble over labels, is to think of eight core trends in this backsliding. Uh, and I'll just go over them quickly. The first, as I said, is the inscription of ethnic majoritarianism into the ident identity of the constitution. And this is at the core of the crisis of liberal constitutionalism in India right, right now. Almost everything else follows from it. Uh, which is the idea that India is a Hindu nation, that the consolidation of Hindu majority Indian political power has to be inscribed in law in different ways. Uh, so it has to, for example, inflect definitions of citizenship. It has to inflect definitions of uh, interreligious conversion and so on and so forth. Right? So I think majority Indian is the first element. Second is, of course, the erosion of civil liberties, uh, where we have reached a point where you're not even guaranteed a habeas corpus hearing by the Indian Supreme Court, a cornerstone of liberal constitutionalism. The third is the erosion of checks and balances. And I just want to dwell on this point for a second because one of, I think, the big shocks of the current political moment in India is that institutions that were formerly the most protected uh, in terms of constitutional designs, so for the Supreme Court of India, for example, which was described until very recently as the most powerful court in the world, has actually been the first to most spectacularly abdicate its constitutional role. Uh, and in fact, if you look at institutions that are holding up versus institutions that are not, uh, the formal design of the institution, its formal measures of independence, um, uh, accountability, are actually no predictor. Um, in fact, I think we are following the trend that Tom actually highlighted in the United States, that it's actually lower courts, lower officials that are uh, uh, lower level judges who are putting up a little bit more resistance, uh, I think, uh, to authoritarianism than, for example, the Supreme Court of India did. And it does suggest that uh, there is actually something like a serious ideological conversion that can overcome even the formal checks and balances um, of a constitution. Fourth feature, of course, is the decline of federalism and over-centralization, because federalism, one of the important checks and balances, particularly in a large country like India, uh, uh, power is distributed amongst different provinces. Fifth feature, control of the information order. Uh, and I think this is something we're still trying to get our head around in terms of what it means for modern politics. Uh, there's no question at one level that we are at a moment where you know it feels like probably in the moment after the invention of the printing press where there's an extraordinary new information order emerging, uh, uh, technologically, uh, sort of the way it's kind of empowering uh, 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 or disempowering different uh, communities. And so much of the legal effort Uh, of media, for example, um, and of course the regulation of big tech, which uh, is now becoming increasingly complicit in some ways uh, in this uh, information order. Finally, the vigilantism of the political culture, uh, 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 where uh, democracies are always edgy, uh, but there is no question that if you look at the career graphs of which kinds of politicians will get rewarded, it has in a sense moved from near criminality, as it were, occasionally at the margins, uh, to downright vigilantism and finding the personalized cult uh, of, of a leader. Now, the question I have, and this is the thought I kind of want to end with, is what is it that makes this kind of a degradation of constitutionalism possible? Uh, I mean, we can talk about, you know, formal. The point, in a sense, what I want to emphasize is that I think we actually need to place this degradation in the broader political economy, emerging political economy of 
liberal democracies like India, and I suspect this applies to places like Hungary or possibly Turkey as well uh, in different ways. So the first thing to recognize is that this degradation of constitutionalism, which is literally a remaking of the social order, right? It's a remaking of the definition of citizenship. It's the remaking of the definition of the inter uh, information order, remaking of the definition of constitution units of the republic. There is a social movement behind this, not just a political one. Uh, that it has taken years and years of social activism of civil society organizations, particularly if you think of an organization like the RSS, the largest civil society organization probably in the world, uh, to, in a sense, transform the nature of social relations. Right? Its ideological objectives are defined by a social movement, not merely given by a logic of staying on in power or electoral contestation. And I think this is something to, I think, remember about uh, this moment. The second, I think, thing is, so you might say, look, we always used to take for granted centrism in Indian politics because there'll be a lot of cross-cutting cleavages, right? Caste, class, region, religion, uh, uh, lots of different cross-cutting identities, lots of cross-cutting economic interests, right? Uh, that would distribute social power in a way that would act as a check and balance on the centralization of political power. And I think one of the interesting sociological hypotheses, in the sense I want to put it, I used to be skeptical of it, but I think I'm more warming up to Hannah Arendt's atomization hypothesis, which is that there have been independent social processes in place where these, what we thought of as natural units of interest identification, have actually, in some senses, broken down which create the opportunity for right-wing political parties to insert a much more generative conception of political identity into the political discourse. I think the left and center in India have been much more sociologically deterministic. There are these cross-cutting cleavages. Um, we can figure out what interests follow from those identities and interests. And if you could just stitch, stitch together a coalition. The right has actually taken on the project of saying that as individuals are getting disembedded from relations of caste and region, you can actually mobilize them into larger, in some senses, different identities. And the last and final point in this, which is, I think is important, which is uh, the conditions of the success of this kind of majoritarian authoritarianism is created by a background economic crisis that first of all exposes the old order to be too plutocratic, too inegalitarian, and too elitist. But one thing that sustains the centralization is the united support of business and capital, uh, which is very important to the functioning of authoritarian regimes and very important to the functioning of the political system. I think the difference between India and the United States is in the United States, Jeff Bezos can still fund the Washington Post. Uh, Indian capital has more or less unanimously for ideological reasons and for in reasons of perhaps their own business self-interest thrown its weight behind this melody of authoritarianism and competition. So, so it's, it's in a sense the classic desire of big capital to throw its weight behind the strong state which actually in some senses distributes social power in society uh, uh, very uh, unevenly. So my submission to you, I think, is that if we are thinking of constitutionalism, uh, we have to go back to some old-fashioned questions of what are constitutions supposed to constitute and how are they supposed to constitute it in relation to the identities of concrete and active uh, social agents, nation, caste, class, region, and 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 and, 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 and you know, and so forth, and that what we are witnessing in India right now, I think with the emergence of the BJP and the kind of constitutionalism uh, they are practicing, is a new constitutionalism style. It's not liberalism in the art of separation. It is actually about knitting together state and society by making party identity the central identity of Indians. In that sense, its model is actually the Communist Party, uh, where you want to constitutionally position the party as a mediator of all social activity rather than allow independent and autonomous sources of power uh, uh, or, or the constitution of identities uh, in society. I'll 
I'll end there. Um, we can take up some questions later. Thank you. Great. Um, and for top, since this happened after the program went to press, let me say congratulations on your appointment as the 2021 Social Science Research Council fellow. Um, let's have about uh, 10 minutes for the roundtable participants to ask questions of and engage with each other. And I'd like to um, start off by asking for some engagement with the apparent puzzle raised by the um, the conjunction of Turku's emphasis on the advantages of constitutional discipline being sufficiently substantial that even authoritarian and autocratic governments um, will seek to use them to gain gain credibility advantages. And yet, constitutional discipline apparently seeming so fragile and vulnerable to degradation in longstanding constitutional democracies. Um, what, what, what is it that allows those things to coexist? Um, but if people don't want to pick up that particular baton, then go ahead and talk with each other about what you'd like to talk with each other about. I have a separate, so Pratap, you go first. <laughs> okay, uh, no, no, very quickly, Jacob, and th that's a really interesting question. I think, I mean, one way to think about it is that, so in order for constitutions to work, they have to have disciplinary, eff disciplinary effects, right? Uh, I mean, the question is, which is the social power that is wielding those disciplining effects? Um, and in some senses, I think what authoritarian movements can do, and that's why I'm kind of emphasizing the sh shift in the basis of social power, right, is you can have courts, you can have judges uh, thinking of their fiduciary duties as limiting governmental power. Right? Uh, the very same institution uh, can actually quickly turn around and say, look, but there is this other function of constitutionalism, which is public order, uh, which is the constitution of a new identity. And the very same authority that gives us the authority to limit government power also gives us the authority to pronounce on these kinds of uh, issues in some ways. So, you know, and that's why the flip actually requires, I think, to my mind, uh, a political reprioritization of what you think is the objective, the social objective that uh, the Constitution should be achieving at this point. Turku, do you want to respond to Jacob? Because I have a question for Turku. <laughs> so, go ahead, Tom, go ahead. No, I'm still thinking about it. Great. So I actually have a question for each of you. Uh, and maybe I'll start with Pratap, actually, which is um, that was you know, a wonderful overview of the situation. Um, I wanted to ask you about something that I see in common in India and the United States uh, in, on, in the backsliding, which is the uh, <laughs> winking mobilization of private violence. Um, so I don't know if many of you know, but the Republicans in several states have just passed bills that immunize from civil liber civil liability anyone who drives into protesters if, if, under certain conditions. You could it's, it's sort of encouraging, like take your car, you see some protesters, go for it. Um, and obviously in India, you know, there's a lot of sort of private stuff behind this social movement. So I guess that's I guess the question when you when this, this particular mode of a social movement using the state to reconstitute society in its image, to what degree does that even require private violence? It seems quite, um, quite symbiotic and, uh, and dangerous. And that actually suggests then a response, which is to really insist on the state monopoly of use of force. So that was a question for Pratap. For Turku, you know, your functional constitutionalism seems, it's hard for me to kind of grapple with the EU in this regard, because to me, it seems like it has facilitated the democratic backsliding in the, at the national level. Um, and that's precisely because, as Pratap said, you know, capital is flowing and everyone's in favor of that. And oh my God, we couldn't actually like suspend Poland or, uh, uh, or Hungary, which of course is possible. It just would, it's just not in the economic logic of it. So I was wondering if your two 
those two constitutionalisms didn't undermine each other or weren't in serious tension. Tom, why, why don't you go first? Are you sure? I mean, <laughs> why didn't you go? Or... Okay, I guess very uh, <laughs> quickly. Um, so, Tom, I, th I think I think there's two things happening, right? So, one, there is of course the the empowering, the legal empowering of vigilantes you know, in some way. So, I mean, there's always been kind of unofficial violence, uh, you know. Uh, and then there's the second counter movement as well, which is also the disempowering, disallowing of legitimate protest. Uh, in fact, one of the interesting catalogs you can compile is the, 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 the kind of increase in the number of orders and municipal laws that just allow regular bread and butter kind, disallow regular bread and butter kind of democratic protest, right? So in some senses, both those things, uh, you, know, in, you know, in some ways uh, parallel each other. But, but, but the crucial difference, I think, and which is where I think the concept of the party state actually does matter a lot, right? Because in some senses, this is not characterized as private vigilante violence. It is actually, in a sense, characterized as, and it's legitimized by a party. It is in the aid of that party, which now comes to stand in for the whole of the people and whole of the state, right? Uh, that, in fact, what the state was doing or what, what, what the state was doing in exercising its powers was actually exercising power against, as it were, the people. And it's the party now that is the stand-in for the people rather than, uh, uh, you know, the formal institutions, right? Um, so in that sense, they would actually disagree that it's actually licensing private. I mean, of course, in our sense, it is private violence, right? Uh, uh, but 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 it is it is creating the conditions through the party, right? Of in a sense a different interpretation of what kind of hegemonic violence is actually required, right? Uh, to, and it's legitimized on the grounds that look, liberals use state violence to do this to us. I mean, there's also that 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 victimized symbol, right? Because they disembedded our communities, and all we are in a sense doing is using this vigilante violence to reclaim that. I want to just take a second to acknowledge that uh, these are things that Don Horowitz has been telling us for a long time. Yeah. Um, I talked in my opening remarks about the the analytical problem of taking the stability of liberal democracy for granted. Don Horowitz has also been stressing the analytical problem of taking the Weberian state as just for granted, invisible in the background, as opposed to uh, an opportunity that uh, uh, providing the capacity to for state actors to actively mobilize violence by non-state actors um, for strategic reasons. Sure. So um, I'll respond to the, you know, I've been thinking about the, the puzzle that Jacob posed, which I think is, is um, really interesting. And, and, and I, I don't think that the first thought I have on it is necessarily going to be the best one. <laughs> it rarely is, right? Um, uh, but, but here's the, you know, um, I think part of the puzzle is, you know, comes from the fact that limited government, right? The, the the idea of disciplining public power by means of, you know, a higher, you know, by means of um, a higher order norms, doesn't necessarily eliminate um, the scourge of arbitrary power. And in fact, of course, limited government can foster the arbitrary exercise of power um, when the limits are observed in the face of things like racial oppression or you know, socioeconomic deprivation. Um, and in the same way, I think constitutional discipline can and does get used in ways that are strategic um, and, and leave you know, quite a bit of room for, for the arbitrary exercise of power. Um, and um, you know, some thoughts in response to Tom's um, a remark that you know, perhaps the like, constitutionalism at the EU level, like works to undermine liberal constitutionalism at the member state level. I think that's exactly right. I think um, the, the, the interesting thing is specifying the mechanisms, right, through which it, it, it works, it has that effect. Um, and I like to call that, you know, there's a the famous um, 2000 article um, by 
Kohen, Macedo, and Maracha called, you know, democracy enhancing multilateralism. And I, I call this democracy eroding multilateralism, um, which is, you know, um, uh, times of change, how times have changed. And um, I think, so one of the mechanisms is outlined by Dan Kellerman um, very astutely, which is, you know, he says that um, uh, giving more powers to the European Parliament has been touted for many decades as a way of democratizing EU decision-making, but actually, uh, the empowerment of the European Parliament means that partisan politics at the EU level becomes much more important. Um, and because we have, you know, Euro Europe, you know, European wide party coalitions, um, that gives, um, uh, you know, dominant parties within democratic member states some incentives to overlook authoritarian maneuverings by their, you know, ideological brethren in other member states in order to uh, preserve their power within the parliament, right? Because the, you know, because these authoritarians are also helping to deliver votes in the European parliament um, that are needed for, um, for, for major things. So politically, it can actually have that democracy eroding effect. Another mechanism I think that, um, um, that, that uh, is important is that um, the constitutionalization of, of, of uh, norms at the supranational level without sufficient mechanisms, you know, ways of, you know, democratic contestation of those norms um, encourages and, and, and sort of strengthens um, habits of arbitrary rule on the part of member state governments and sort of without going into the kind of great and gory detail of how decision making, you know, how, how legislation happens in the EU. Um, decisions that are made at the EU level by government representatives tend to be used at the domestic level as kind of trump cards with which to undermine domestic opposition. And it's a very convenient way of saying, um, you know, the EU has tied our hands, right? This is, this, this is the decision. And, um, and, and, and as ways of bypassing domestic checks and balances. And that, and that's very troubling. So that there's a, you know, there, there's a, there's a pattern of like legislation through, um, uh, through executive um, organs that um, that get strengthened because of the way that um, decision making in the EU is configured, and I think it's possible to to apply this to some to other international institutions as well. Great. Uh, well, I'm happy to encourage you to continue talking with each other. Now, let's also open the floor up to questions from the audience. Uh, please use the raised hand function in Zoom if you'd like to ask a question. Sam. Great. Um, can everybody? Okay, I assume people can hear me. Okay, great. Uh, so basically, I'm. I mean, this, these are all fascinating presentations. First of all, so thank you. Um, just still a little bit formulating the question, but I, I'm curious about this idea that um, of, of authoritarian constitutionalism um, and most uh, the way that I think um, it was it was discussed is as something that sort of exists elsewhere in regimes that are already sort of authoritarian regimes or hybrid regimes. But I think someone like Corey Robin, for instance, would argue that it actually characterizes the United States um, and is, is an important part of um, backsliding that we're seeing here, right? So of course, Trump is in certain ways an assault on constitutionalism, but in other ways, I think he would point out, right? It depends on adherence to constitutional rules and, uh, you know, su such as the, um, the the Senate and the Electoral College and these kinds of things, right? And and it's in fact leaning into these kinds of these these facets of, of at least United States constitutionalism that is protecting the sort of minority rule in the United States against a kind of uh, majoritarianism that would um, that that might w wish to get rid of some of those constitutional constraints. So I, I wonder how you think about. Uh, that aspect of constitutionalism in the U.S. Um, well, I'm the American token American. Oh, Turk is here. Sorry. I'm um, so good. But, uh, but, the, but I guess I would say I don't think I'd buy that. Uh, that is, you know, it's the same minoritarian structures which are used to protect, you know, good minorities and bad minorities and such. I don't think it's inherently in any sense, authoritarian, where it becomes authoritarian when 
you have a party that's willing to wield that and then not give up power or not accept uh, the other side, uh, you know, when it, when it, when, uh, when the shoe reverses. And so I think that's pretty, pretty dangerous. And we are obviously in a, a moment like that. Um, I have some more to say, but I'm going to stop for a second. Who so, has to stay on that as well? Yeah. So, so two. I mean, two things. Like one is, um, you know, this is sort of what I was trying to get at when I said, you know, I don't, I don't consider authoritarian constitutionalism to be like a, you know, a, a completely different thing, right? But just um, uh, something that capitalizes on and sort of pushes to the extreme certain um, patterns that are inherent to, you know, higher law constitutionalism. Um, uh, but um, at the same time, I want to say that, um, it, you know, I, I don't want to characterize everything that is seemingly kind of counter majoritarian um, within a constitutional system as authoritarian. Right. I, I've been having a similar I mean, I haven't that I haven't thought about it extensively in the U.S. context, except sort of as a, you know, as, as a citizen, but um, um, as a resident alien rather um but but i have thought about i have this debate in you know with eu scholars where there's a similar thing right i made a distinction between authoritarian functional constitutionalism there are plenty of eu scholars who would say that's authoritarian constitutionalism too right like that what 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 you know what eurozone governance is is authoritarian and i, I, I sort of want to hold the line and say like i've seen authoritarianism like i i see that there are serious democratic objections to this, but but uh, you know, um, but it's important. To, I, I think it's important to to, to hold that hold, at least as an analytical matter. Shika Damia. Hi, apologies for that. Uh, thanks. This is really an excellent panel, and uh, enjoyed everyone's remarks. Uh, particularly, uh, you know, Pratap, uh, been following your work and uh, admire uh, your bravery on, in the circumstances that you're operating in. And this question is basically a simple one for you, which is that, you know, if you're from India and have been observing Indian politics and observing your friends and family reacting to Indian politics, your point about how the party has become the source of identity transcending so many other divides uh you know regional caste class what have you is a really important one uh question only is that given the debac uh, the debacle of the pandemic and the bjp's handling of it do you see any signs that this partisan identification is beginning to break now that people are actually you know uh, overcoming that to hold the government accountable or because if this doesn't do it, I mean, I don't know what will, and uh, my last hope will be gone. Um, very quickly. So I agree with you. I mean, I think you're for the first time actually beginning to see some elite pushback. I mean, even people who are actually quite, I think, embedded in the party are at least beginning to sort of acknowledge uh, that there is a potential of political risk here and, and, a, and, 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 and a debacle. Um, so I think it's going to provide a political opening, um, but I think there are two things that I would worry about and, and you know, why we are in uncharted waters in the Indian context, which is that for the first time you have a party, at least in significant states, that has empowered these different vigilante groups, right? And they, they have not yet been tested on what would happen if it looked like they were going to lose power. Right. Uh, so I would actually expect in the short run, at least, uh, uh, post pandemic or immediately after, I think a lot more of, I think, the kind of authoritarian and nationalistic diversion, re-diversion that you've actually seen. Um, uh, and, uh, what the dynamic of it, how that gets played out, I think is, 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 is important. But so in that sense, it might get a little bit worse before, uh, it gets better, but it has certainly given an opening by taking off the sheen. Uh, I mean, if, if 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 one needed an argument, at least of the kind of technocratic economic competence side uh, of the story. 
Pratik Mahajan. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, my question's also for Dr. Mehta. I'm sorry you have to answer so many. Um, <clears throat> so I was wondering about the slight to authoritarianism in India being facilitated by a huge social movement as well as being backed by forces of big Indian capital. So what what kind of counter movement do you think is necessary to resist um, th this backsliding? Like, is it social mobilization on? And upcoming um, challenges to the labor laws that the parliament has uh, tried to pass? So, no, it's a very good question. Um, I think, again, a very quick response. So, you know, I think right now the important point, actually, and I think, I think, I think, I think this is again a limitation of the kind of center left thinking, right? That we are kind of, again, clutching to straws here. I mean, frankly, the farmers' movement is, is dissipated. Uh, uh, and partly because of the internal contradictions of the movement. I mean, to be, I mean, you know, uh, uh, I think completely honest about it. Uh, the two big advantages that the BJP had, right, is that it is doing now and has been doing for the last 15, 20 years what the Congress party did when it built the national movement. Half the game is actually having a social presence. You can't show up six months before and say, I will promise this, I will, right? I mean, in, in a sense, and if you look at all the literature and political mobilization, right? It is in a sense about creating a familiar identity that you are in a sense comfortable with. And that vacuum is going to be a lot more difficult to fill because almost all other part, political parties have in that sense imploded. I mean, you, you just count the numbers on every election, right? I mean, you know, even those who know we'll never vote for the BJP, they show up 15 times to our house, right? Congress almost never shows up. Uh, so I think it's actually the mobilization part in some senses, almost like a sort of second freedom struggle kind of story, right? Um, uh, 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 reclaiming civil society organizations in some ways, right? Um, and that's why I think for them, control of capital and information order, order is important because they know that you could be politically strong but if counter social mobilization comes from civil society, different kinds of organizations, uh, that actually makes them vulnerable. So the bold, bo old boarding answer, you just have to be out there and out there and out there. Uh, Jeffrey Lenowitz, I had you on my list, but you, your hand went away. Okay. Yes, I, I was gonna ask a similar question, sorry, so. Okay, uh, Javier Cuso Salas. Oh, well, thank you to Pratap, Turku, and Tom. Great panel. I have a question that I don't know to whom direct, but it's about the following issue. We are, I mean, in this panel, you have talked about democratic erosion, uh, Tom, and also Turku, and Pratap, you know, vis a vis authoritarian populists and, and other leaders that, that and might want to use some forms of what looks like constitutionalism in their favor. But I was wondering to what extent the democratic deficit that you can, you can say that eroded democracy at the national level in the European Union, for instance. We, we have heard that for 25 years now, but in a way that has fed the notion I mean, that democratic erosion at the national level in this, in the case of the European Union, has fed authoritarian populists in the national, at the national level to say, look, it's about time we rule ourselves. I mean, Marine Le Pen, who is dangerously competitive, I, I heard a very, you know, very articulate speech saying, you know, to what extent French are controlling the economic legislation that rules their economic life. And uh, people like Alan Wolf saying, you know, Brexit was too much globalization, too fast. So I was wondering to what extent you might have not just democratic uh, deficit. Uh, I mean, if you can characterize the democratic deficit of, in the case of the European Union, it's very clear, but in other regions of the world, doesn't, this might 
B, a deficit that comes from other international organizations. And the, how do you see that feeding authoritarian populism? This really, this too fast, too, too much too fast in terms of technocratic governance. And just to finish, you can, if you, if you take out the, the, our lenses of constitutional scholars, even a constitutional court might be seen as a technocratic device. I mean, we're used to look at the central bank as a technocratic body, but, but you might also regard a very activist constitutional court, particularly in, in a, or a regional international human rights body that doesn't have, in Latin America, we have the problem that we don't even have the room of maneuver that the European Court of Human Rights has when they, when they have, you know, they leave countries some leeway to implement the rules. Yeah, so, sorry if it's to lose the question and too broad. Yeah, I jump in. Uh, so, I think, you know, your, your first framing of your question points to what we might call like an identity deficit, right? Like, I'd rather be ruled by this incompetent clown, but at least he's our incompetent clown rather than some competent technocrat who speaks a different language or, you know, is sitting in Belgium, for God's sake. So, so that's really, uh, very, it's actually just what Pratap was saying. Like we're mobilizing, you know, um, uh, you know, I, I sort of the people through, <laughs> through, through parties and such. And I think maybe that's something we're seeing this kind of attempt to have people based parties. And so, but the relationship between that and the international, I think is much more complex than you're suggesting. And my next book is actually advertisement here. It's called Democracies in International Law. So it's looking at these regional governance mechanisms and they're very, very different. Africa, you have these you know, little trade blocks where the trade courts, without sometimes even official mandates, are actually playing a democracy supporting role by uh, adjudicating cases on fundamental rights, even though um, they're not really empowered to do so. And so there's much more of a cooperative relationship between the democratic uh, forces in pretty difficult conditions and the transnational elite and technocratic institutions in that country. In Latin America, you know, you have the court of San Jose, but as you know, much better than I, countries ignore it. You know, it is sought to project its authority, but not actually embedded itself very effectively. And that's actually, you know, you can argue good or bad, but I don't think it's been as democracy eroding, partly because some of its decisions, have, you know, well, we won't have to get into the, the details. So. I think, and of course, in Asia, there's no such thing at all, right? There's no regional organization of any kind. ASEAN doesn't really. So um, that means that I think the dynamics are different in different parts of the world. And in some cases, I see these technocratic cases just being another example of what I was saying before about institutions not democratically legitimated, which can play a role in staving off backsliding in unpredictable and contingent ways, but they're still there and I think still a resource. So, um, yeah, I, I, I totally agree, uh, Tom, that, you know, we should, um, we should not be treating the EU as, as, um, as an exemplar um, in important ways that, you know, it's, it's um, you know, the, the cliche is to say it's too generous, right? But like, it, it is also not the inevitable future of other international organizations or even regional organizations to become the EU. So it's not, you know. Um, so, so I think that's exactly right. And I want to make a distinction sort of similar to the, in the direction in which Tom was going, which is that the EU's problem um, is, um, is, 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 you know, partly too much technocratic governance, right? Like exactly as, as, as you said, Javier, that, that um, and, it, and it creates a predictable um, backlash. Um, but that it's not the problem of other states that are bearing the brunt of economic globalization um, that find themselves at the mercy of global casino capitalism. Their problem, we might say, is a deficit of proper 
you know, governance at the international level, regulatory institutions at the international level. So, and I think that, that so, so, you know, too much technocracy versus too little to kind of to really simplify it. Um, I, I, you know, I like the example, the, the example I like from the EU is the example of chlorinated chicken, right? So some, you know, some countries have no choice but to import chlorinated chicken because they don't have any kind of, you know, um, regulatory mechanism in place to reject chlorinated chicken from the US. The Europeans, right? Like, so, so, so you, you're either going to, you're either going to make your peace with chlorinated chicken or you're going to make your peace with technocratic governance. I think that's a like that's an important dilemma that gets lost at just how much of um, a, a sort of, um, I don't know, buffer the EU is in terms of cushioning the impacts of um, you know, what, what Danny Roger calls hyper globalization. It, it doesn't do great PR, I guess. And, and the tech, you know, technocratic overload is real, but there are also, you know, but, but, but it does fulfill that buffer function that, um, doesn't exist in most countries, particularly, um, particularly for the poorer ones. Uh, may I come in on this, Jacob, quickly? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, just one more thought to sort of, I think, add uh, to what Tom and Turku said is, you know, one, of course, the distinction between different forms of uh, international dependence. So I think trade in a democratic context like India has functioned very differently. And there's there's been pushbacks, so for example, you know, uh, on agriculture, on pharmaceuticals. Uh, there have been the usual mechanisms of democracy. There's been a kind of back and forth. And it's not been all this one-way dependence street. Um, I think finance is, I think, more complicated um, uh, because for two reasons. I think that the mechanism by which the international, I think, plays a role is when it leads to the perception that there is a secession of elites, right? So it's not so much the fact that you're embedded in international institutions or that even you're technocratic. I mean, to be honest, I don't think there was ever the golden age of social democratic sort of, you know, a uh, 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 power, right? Uh, but the difference between saying that your elites are committed to some common sense of a public and actually are in a sense invested in the public institutions and social life versus a form of globalization that enables a succession of elites in all kinds of ways. I mean, through mobility, through education, through, you know, I think that mechanism is actually, I think, a lot more important uh, 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 rather than the technocratic one. Uh, and in populist rhetoric, at least, that's the one they target, right? Which is that this system, it's not that they target technocracy and stuff, it created elites that, you know, will fly on their jet and sort of go away when the crunch comes or something. Kevin, do you have a pretty quick question? Um, I suppose it's it's sort of just a, a reflection question. Um, so I want to just invite consideration of Pratep's idea that the right is forging a new identity um, and the left takes a more sociologically deterministic view. This was this was a phrase that he used. And I just, it, it occurred to me that if we think about the project of the nation state partially as a constitutional one um, that's aimed at building a constitution that's like specifically tailored to a particular people, um, then I wonder whether we can see emerging forms of authoritarian constitutionalism um, uh, being aimed at specific kinds of outcomes, empowering certain groups and so forth, um, as really kind of an attempt to reform the constitutional order along some new, more exclusionary idea of national identity. And so in that way, it would be a kind of a continuation of the national, of the nation state project in pursuit of a changed idea of like what the nation is, which is being formed in this crucible of kind of right-wing social ideas and agitation and, 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 and social movements. have a I, I i i actually agree with that, that kevin and that's very that's that's actually very well uh, put both i think characterizing i think the nature of the rights political project and why it can in a sense mobilize a certain kind of language of constitutionalism uh, and press it in its in its service i'll just say i spend a lot of time with people who are writing constitutions in various countries and um you know i guess that's and of course it wouldn't actually work to say, ah, we're just going to borrow the German one. It works pretty well, even though functionally for the sort of governance stuff, 
would probably a perfectly be a perfectly good solution. There's something about the discourse of it, which, as you say, requires almost a romantic nationalism. We are choosing our institutions for us. And, uh, you know, that's a very, you know, that's the, that's the constitutive point that I want to emphasize over and over again. Well, great. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, this was a really terrific beginning to the conference. Uh, all very stimulating contributions and things that I think we will be returning to in conversation over the course of the whole event. Um, we're going to try to stick to at least half hour breaks between each two sessions in light of how much time everyone has spent on Zoom and the needs to do things in your own homes. So please join me in quickly thanking our roundtable participants and we will reconvene at 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern time.